Okay, welcome everybody. I really odd to believe we're doing this again. Um, and I fear we will be doing it again in two weeks. Um, this is Israel's endless war more than any other war in our history. It theoretically is now longer than the War of Independence. I actually think it's longer than the War of Independence because the War of Independence was not fought uh, straight through. The War of Independence had three different or actually four different periods. And there were periods in between those periods when there was no fighting going on. So this has been going on now for 121 days, which is a very long time for a country that its mantra is short wars. Um, so uh, right now we're standing in this never, never land. Most of Israel's discussions relates around this hostage deal that I don't think will be taking place. We don't know. The talk now is that it's seven o'clock our time, which is an hour probably as we towards the very end of this as the, we're finishing up uh, questions. There's supposed to be an answer from Hamas. Um, we'll find out. I'm sure I'll get notifications on all my devices, so I'll inform everybody what that answer is. I'm pretty sure the answer will be, yes, we want a ceasefire, but only under terms that the war comes to a complete end, which is something the Israeli government is not willing to do. The hostage families, of course, want Israel to do that, obviously. You know, there is a clear break, let's put it that way. There was a, I think I showed the poll last night. Um, no, actually, I didn't show that poll last night, but uh, 60 some percent, 65 percent of Israelis are opposed to a deal at all costs. Um, so, um, so that's something that um, we'll have to see. Uh, so we'll see how that that works out. It's it's creating a, a real split in the country to some extent, but on some extent it's a, it's a fake split because Hamas does not want a deal really. Um, once they give up the, host the hostages, they have nothing, and that's their one point. And they want a deal that basically guarantees that they stay in power. And any Israeli government that does that um, is days are very very numbered. Even if the current coalition's days are numbered to begin with. Something like that will number them to, you know, close to nothing. So we'll have to see. Um, like I said, I do not expect the deal will take place at the moment. Um, on the other hand, the army has failed. It has failed to, to uh, liberate any but one hostage. One woman hostage or young woman hostage was liberated at the beginning. And since then, none have been liberated. And that's really a, a great failure about, about the IDF. And of course, therefore, the IDF basically says, you can get a deal, take the deal, because we haven't done our job in terms of uh, being able to liberate any hostages. The IDF is fighting in Khan Yunus, which has been, I've been hearing for the last three weeks, that's another day or two until we finish in Khan Yunus, and every day seems to keep on going. Um, and we're fighting as if the hostages and the Muhammad Def and the other leadership of, um, of Hamas are sitting under Khan Yunus in the tunnels underneath Khan Yunus. I'm willing to bet anybody any amount of money they are not there. They've long ago gone to be under Rafiyah or maybe even the humanitarian zone. Um, they're not there. They're not sitting and waiting for the Israeli troops to reach them at this point. Israel is doing things that it's never done before. It's fighting in the tunnels. It's using both technology and pure fighting skills to fight in the tunnels. It's fighting effectively in the tunnels. Uh, Israeli casualties rem remain remarkably, remarkably low. I mean, as much as it hurts every time there's an Israeli casualty, the fact of the matter is uh, people I spoke to before the war were talking about at least 1,000 casualties in order to uh, conquer Gaza. And so now we're a little over 200, and of those 200, at least 40 or 50 were basically a result of accidents, either um, either shooting accidents where we shot, you know, soldiers sh shot each other, or some of the two of those explosions in some form or another that killed so many uh, were in some form or another accidents. And um, so in absolute fighting, the numbers that have been killed have been remarkably, remarkably low. However, 
what's hidden behind that is a remarkably high number of wounded soldiers. In other words, one of the reasons there's so few, relatively speaking, killed in action is the um, medical care that's been given on the battlefield with doctors going with some of the, the elite units all have doctors with them in the field, fighting with them alongside the field, the ability to give first aid of a relatively high level right in the field, followed by the ability to uh, to evacuate those soldiers very quickly um, on helicopters with top doctors on those helicopters, um, able to um, usually um, stabilize the soldiers until they get to the hospital. And then the hospitals, uh, unfortunately, have a lot of experience with, with trauma. And remember, the hospitals are close by too. You know, it's a 20 minute helicopter ride to to Echelov here in Tel Aviv. It's a 10 minute or 15 minute out to Beersheba's main hospital. So they get top rate medical care very quickly. Um, the result is most of them live, uh, but we have a very large number, a few thousand um, wounded soldiers, and a significant number of them amputees and other problems that will last them for their lifetime and will need to be uh, taken care of for their lifetime. So the deaths have been low. And part of the reason is because so many of the people who would have died in a previous war have lived and will live live to grow up and you know bring up their families, see their children and all those other wonderful things that we get in life. So that's wonderful, but we should keep that in mind when we think of the low death toll, that it's not been casualty free. It's just been a low level of deaths, relatively speaking. Meantime, Israeli forces have returned to the north, the area that, quote unquote, we had cleaned up already. Um, yesterday, they've gone both to, um, have both gone both to, um, to Gaza City itself, as well as to um, to the refugee camp, Shati refugee camp in the center, both areas that they've already been to. Um, so that's where we stand um, in terms of the fighting. It just continues. I mean, like I said, every single day I listen to the the military correspondent saying. They're almost there. It was at least three weeks ago. I can remember the first time Or Heller, or it was one of the military correspondents, uh, saying, "Another couple of days, and we'll finish in Khan Yunus. Another couple of days, we're still fighting in Khan Yunus." Now, don't get me wrong; it's difficult, difficult house to house, room to room warfare, warfare, as well as fighting in the tunnels. And again, the results are good. I mean, the re reaction, the results are we are killing. Uh, lots of terrorists every single day, and again, to minimal uh, minimal casualties. So um, that's where we stand at the moment in terms of the in terms of the fighting. Um, we'll have to see um, what happens next. Let's put it that way. If there is a truce, which again I think is unlikely but possible. Um, then Israeli troops will know how to either stay in, in their place or move out of the main cities until the truce ends. And actually, my view is if there's a truce, there will be it will be um, it won't go back. Let's put it that way. I, I don't see this this idea that we could um, have a truce for two weeks or two months, more likely two weeks maybe, but two months or three months. Whenever we want, we can go back in and finish up. But Hamas not going to happen. It's uh, pure political statements. Um, there's no way the world or even the United States is going to support us. Yes, a target assassination. Yes, if Muhammad Def puts his, you know, walks down the street of Rafiach and a drone happens to come by and kill him, no one's going to object anywhere in the world. Um, but actually sending troops back in in large numbers, I don't see it happening. Uh, again, the biggest problem we have is our own problem. And that's if anyone remembers from the original when I started writing, well, when I started writing this during the war, before the ground operation, I said, we cannot have a ground operation without a plan for what's going to be the day after. And we're now, you know, if we if 120 days into the war, we're now 100 days, more, give or take, into the ground operation. And not only don't we have a plan for the day after, 
the cabinet refuses to even discuss a plan for the day after. Um, we're not at the day after, so how can we discuss it? I mean, the most absurd statement in history to make a statement like that. You cannot have a military victory without a political victory. And to have a political victory, you have to have a plan. And without a plan, you can't win. And that's really where we stand at the moment. We have no plan for the day after. We are needlessly angering our best friends by not willing to discuss it. You know, it's one thing if we had a plan, leaving aside the crazy plans of Ben Gvir, we'll get to him in a minute, uh, and some of the people on the far right to resettle Gaza. But leave that part aside. Whatever plan we might have, whether it's clans or whether it's some other, whatever the plan we might have, at least we have a plan and can discuss it. But the inability to even discuss a plan puts us in a terrible position because how can people support us when we have no real plan of what's going to happen the day after? Um, very much, you know, the the problem with this government all along has been, you know, we'll muddle through, we'll muddle through the conflict, we'll muddle through. And, you know, you need to take initiative, even if it's the wrong initiative. You need to have initiative. If you sit and let things happen to you, good things don't tend to happen. And, and that's where we stand now. Of course, the reason we can't have a plan is because the right side of the government, uh, primarily Ben Gvir and Smutrich, have a plan. They want to resettle Gaza, establish Jewish settlements in Gaza. Now, amongst the most insane ideas on earth is to reestablish settlements in Gaza. Why is it insane? I'm not going to talk about the political ramifications. I mean, I think it's obvious what the world would think about that. Um, and I'm just going to talk about the security implications of it. The, you know, they talk about how the settlements are so important in, in the West Bank to maintain security of the whole of Israel. Well, guess what? The fact that we've had 40 gedudim, 40 brigades in the West Bank in order to keep to protect the settlements. Uh, what do you think was going to happen in Gaza? Why did we pull out of Gaza ultimately? It wasn't because we wanted to make a major statement to the Palestinians. Ariel Sharon was not a great lover of the Palestinians, to say the least. Ariel Sharon was a level-headed um realist when it came to security and he said very clearly that the cost of maintaining the settlements in gaza which there were a few divisions well i guess it's brigades a few were great more than a few but a significant number of brigades protecting the nine or ten settlements that existed when the kids from one of the settlements had to go to school they had to have a three you know a, an escort made up of a tank and an armored, armored personnel carrier and everything else to take them to school that does not provide security and you know putting down all the the troops that are required to maintain security on the settlements it's insane totally insane it's an insane idea from a security perspective and again i'm not talking political i'm talking religious just from a purely security position the settlements are a burden on israel not the ones that are in a groups like you know, let's say the gush Etzion, which are a whole bunch of settlements together and they basically extend the border because Gush Etzion backs up against the rest of Israel. Uh, but the settlements that are in the middle of nowhere, every single one of them costs us military personnel, and every single one of them is um, it's a dangerous place. Um, and it's very problematic. But that's what Ben Gvir and Smutrich believe in. Now, they believe it can happen because, well, God protects the Jewish people. At least they have this idea of that that seems to be their idea. Um, being the cynic that I am, at least in terms of religion, Jewish history is not replete with instances, if we pass, you know, every since the biblical times of God protecting the Jewish people, let's put it that way. Uh, the only thing that protects the Jewish people is the Jewish people protecting the Jewish people, and one makes must make its decisions based on security needs and not on some ideology that can take us off the deep end. Now, of course, this is creating a mini crisis with the United States, not a full-fledged crisis yet, but Biden keeps on screaming and Splinkin keeps on screaming, give me a plan for the day after, give me something, something to work with, anything. Now, it doesn't make it, I may not agree with it 100%, but let's start from somewhere and we can negotiate, we can talk about it, we can talk to the Saudis about it, we can try to work something out, but with nothing, what, what do we expect the United States to do? They can be our advocate with nothing? All they, all we can say is what we don't want. Well, that doesn't really work too well when you're trying to create a plan for the day after you want to get. We need the Gulf states in order to rebuild what we destroyed. 
Um, we need somebody in there to take over from Hamas if that's the plan. It's not going to happen unless you have a plan. Unless you can go forward and say, this is the plan, this is what we want, and this is how we're going to go forward. Right now, we do not have a plan. We can't discuss a plan. And it's all because of the political realities of this government. Bibi is dependent on Smutrich and, and Ben Gvir. If they pull out, he will be relying on the majority with uh, Gantz and uh, his people. And he knows those they won't stay very long. Now, the argument is made, well, where's Ben Gvir going to go? Is Ben Gvir going to go call for new elections? The, late, the latest poll that came out on Friday showed the current coalition getting only 48 seats. So what does he want to do? He's, so he'll get a, you know, a significant number of seats and he'll be in the opposition. On the other hand, Ben Gvir isn't always rational and sometimes he just likes to make a point. So I'm not sure. And since he's really not a very good commission, he's not really very good as Minister of International of National Security, he can just say, oh, look, they didn't give me the tools I needed. I got to leave. I had to stand up for my principles and he decides to, to go out. So that's what Bibi is really afraid of. And Bibi is not willing to call his bluff. And as a result, we're all suffering, basically. That's in the South at the moment. Let's turn to the North, which as, compli as complicated as the South seems, the South isn't really that bad because in reality, while we did not free the hostages, which is terrible, and we haven't killed the leadership of Hamas, we have destroyed most of its ability to make war. We seem to have destroyed almost all of its rockets, not all. I'm sure they have some somewhere, but we've destroyed most of almost all of their rockets. The number of rockets they've been firing have been very, very small. Every once in a while, they managed to get off around to Tel Aviv but area, but mostly it's just around Gaza Strip, but even then it's once every couple of days. And we've destroyed, it looks like, most of their underground facilities to manufacture rockets. So in that sense, Gaza is semi-secure. Doesn't mean we've gotten rid of Hamas, but for the moment, it's semi-secure in that level. The North is a much bigger problem in the sense that Hezbollah continues to fire on the settlements Kibbutzim, Moshavim, and the two cities or towns, I guess, along the border, Kiryat Shmon and Shlomi. Uh, its residents remain in, in hotels all over Israel. And there's no real plan of how to get them back anytime soon. The, the residents of those towns are saying, we have to go to war, we have to go to war we're full time with Hezbollah and destroy Hezbollah once and for all. Once and for all. Let's put it this way. I, you know, everyone goes, rah, 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 let's do it. But everyone, when they understand what the consequences will be, are a little less enthusiastic. Number one, the actual fighting themselves, itself with Hezbollah will not be easy. Um, it may not be as difficult as one thought initially. One of the great concerns about the Israeli army in coming up to this war was the fact that since most of our soldiers had never fought in a long time, and our reserve units had hadn't fought in a long time, that they wouldn't know how to fight well. And that's been proven not the case. And unfortunately, a good part of our army is now very much combat, combat trained, combat experienced, and they're experienced fighters going into Lebanon. They'll be well, well equipped and well ready if they get rested, if they get enough time rest, to, to go in and fight in Lebanon. But A, we've tried that before. Three different times we went into Lebanon to create a security zone to go to, to overturn the government. Uh, with three different times we've been in Lebanon and none of them have worked out well, let's put it that way. So it's not at all clear why this time it'll work out well. Last time we got the UN agreement that the Hezbollah will stay north of Latani. They violated the agreement. So what agreement can we get this time that'll make sure they will not violate the agreement? Again, we have a problem in, in both cases. In both cases, when I say both cases, it's Gaza too, because I supported the Gaza withdrawal and I still think it was the right decision, despite everything that's happened since then, but I can discuss that separately. But leave that part aside. I said, the minute we pulled out of Gaza, if they fire one rocket at us, we can level the place. After all, we're not there, we're not occupying. What right do they have to, to fire a rocket at us? Okay, maybe I exaggerated, we can't level all of Gaza, but we could have you know, assassinated a, for every rocket that was fired, assassinate one Hamas person or some version therein, taking strong action, a rocket being fired, 
you take strong action against them. But we didn't. Same thing with Hezbollah. When the first Hezbollah troops crossed the Latani River, we looked the other way instead of killing them, which is what we should have done because we didn't want another war. But you cannot allow, you cannot create an agreement, allow the other side to violate it and say, well, you know, it's better than going to war. Let's let that pass for the moment. We don't want to risk a war. It pays to risk a smaller war than have to fight a bigger war later on. And that's where we stand right now. We are not ready because we're not ready for the casualties that will come. We're not ready for the destruction that will come to our cities. Um, our air defense system, A, needs to be re replenished. I don't know exactly how many, but with the thousands of air intercept missiles we fired in the Gaza war, we don't have an infinite stock of these things. And I'm sure we're producing them 24 seven, but I'm quite sure that our production lines are not designed to turn out 20 or 30 a day. So it will take time to replenish our, our missiles. We have the laser system that looks like it's coming online in the next few months. It'll be a little bit untested, but that can make a strategic difference in terms of Hezbollah's ability to attack us. We have some other untested technologies that may or may not blunt a majority of their attack. But we won't know until it's too late. Let's put it that way. Uh, we don't have alternative power plants. We don't have a system in place. I will make you a bet the Ukrainians are faster at fixing their power plants than we would be if they get hit by Hezbollah missiles. We don't have a plan that says, well, what do we do um, if, uh, you know, two power plants are taken offline? We don't have excess, we don't have excess capacity. Uh, we, our system runs at 85 to 90 percent capacity on regular days. So we don't have that excess capacity that if we lose two big power plants, uh, the country's grid will come down most likely. Um, so we don't have those sort of plans for what to do. And so I would be very, very reluctant as, you know, it's nice to say we need to get these people in the north back to their homes by taking on a major war. We need to try every means possible to negotiate an agreement. And right now, Hochstein, I think is the way he's pronounced his name, the American um, envoy is in, is in Israel today, meeting with uh, Netanyahu and Gallant and Gantz and everybody else. And I think he goes to Lebanon tomorrow or the next day. And his goal is to try to negotiate an agreement that moves the Hezbollah forces north of the Tani. His first attempt did not succeed, but maybe, maybe he'll be successful um, this time. Uh, we are being rather successful in, um, in hurting Hezbollah. We are killing a significant number of their personnel. We're hitting a lot of their strategic targets in the south. Um, we've done a good job of doing that, but not enough to deter them. Let's put it that way. So maybe it's hurting enough that they're willing to come to some, some sort of agreement. I do not know, um, but it's a big problem. It's a big problem that we have a security. We once had a security zone into Lebanon, 15 miles. Now we have a security zone into Israel, five miles, where people can't live. And that is not a good situation to say the least. That's where we stand in terms of the North. Um, let's touch briefly on our friends, the Houthis, who did fire another ballistic missile at us on Friday. I didn't mention it in the update yesterday, but they fired a ballistic missile at us on Friday. It was once again down by Israel's Chet system, um, arrow system, um, which is good and bad. I mean, it's good that it, it's being down. I mean, it's very good. It's it's better than one could imagine because we've spent 20 years developing this uh, 21st century anti-missile system and people said it will never work. Well, guess what? It works. And um, the Iranians have to be thinking seven times over if they were ever thinking of launching a potential nuclear strike against Israel because I wouldn't want to be in Iran if they launched a nuclear missile at us and we downed it some ways over the Jordanian desert, which is what would happen. Uh, and then we'd have to make a terrible choice how to respond, but I'll leave that part to somebody else. Um, again, the same way I wouldn't want to make a decision personally between hostages and ending the war, 
I wouldn't want to have to make the decision how to respond to a nuclear attack from Iran that failed. So that's a whole other problem, but deterrence would require some very significant response. Um, so that's where we stand. So the United States has been attacking the Houthis pretty regularly at this point. They attacked again last night. Um, the problem with attacking the Houthis is they managed to take on the Saudis for almost a year with constant attacks on the, the Saudis. Yes, the Saudis are not nearly as good as the American forces. They don't have the firepower the U.S. has. They don't have the pilots that America has. Uh, but they were very successful in not being overwhelmed by the Saudi air attacks. Um, so I'm not sure where this goes now for, You know, beyond that. Um, the United States will continue doing that. And of course, the U.S. attacked Iranian targets in Iraq and in uh, Syria. You know, it's one of these situations where it's all good and well, and we want to, and America wants to avoid a war with Iran, which I understand. And the last thing Biden needs right now is oil going to, I don't know, $200 a barrel because the United States gets into a war with Iran before the election. And Trump going around saying, uh, you know, uh, it wouldn't happen under me. Um, so, um, but the reality is the problem is the Iranian regime. And the United States needs a concerted plan to delegitimize and overthrow that regime. It is a very unpopular regime inside of Iran. If you had free elections in Iran tomorrow, they'd be out of office as quickly as you could count the votes. Um, but their raison, raison d'etre is to be anti-American and anti-Israel. So uh, unless you understand that and act accordingly, um, you're not going to be able to take them on and change the strategic situation. So, you know, it's, it goes to multiple administrations and it's certainly you know i the biggest mistake was george uh george bush jr who decided to attack iraq when he should have attacked iran if he wanted to attack somebody um but that's history alternative history um we you know what will be we'll have to see um but it's a challenge um lastly semi-domestically i want to also comment briefly on Ben Gvir's statement today in the Wall Street Journal that around in this country has made big headlines and gotten tremendous pushback. He gave in the Wall Street Journal that Biden is stopping Israel from winning and it would have been better under Trump. Uh, that's basically what he had to say. Um, he was pushed back by most, uh, by both the opposition, obviously, but Aryeh Derry, who's not known to make too many political statements, he's the head of Shas immediately was interviewed and came out with a statement that said, I want to right now thank um, President Biden, who's been the most supportive president in Amer in Israel's history, both morally, financially, and uh, politically in terms of the United Nations and everything else. He went on to say, Biden has done this at a political cost to himself, and we'll be ever be grateful for President Biden. The other side of this, of course, is Trump would be a disaster for Israel. Not because he hates Israel, and I have no idea how he how he feels this moment about Israel. It's not even relevant. But his isolationist policies would be a disaster for Israel because Israel is strong with American support because America is part of a larger coalitions. If the United States becomes isolationist, which Trump is doing, uh, if the Congress continues to block aid to Ukraine, which is a disaster by blocking that aid, then how can you support Israel and give money to Israel and not to Ukraine? There's no logic involved in that whatsoever. Um, to be honest with you, Ukraine needs the aid more than the, more than Israel does. The only reason Israel needs it more is Ukraine is getting so much aid now from Europe and other countries. Um, but that's the reality. And so Trump would be a disaster for Israel, not because of his policies to Israel directly, but because an isolated America is an America that can't really help Israel. And uh, that's that's the reality. And anyone who supports or thinks Trump is good for Israel does not understand the realities of geopolitics. Once again, not about Trump's policies to Israel. It's about Trump's worldview and how that plays into the um, strategic picture of the world. And that's um, pretty much where it stands. Okay, we're half, with the half an hour point, at this point, I'll be happy to take questions on anything. Just raise your hand or whatever that is. Um, and I will recognize you if I see you. Um,
seeing anybody. Who? David Judson. Why don't I see? Okay, go ahead and unmute yourself, David Judson. Yeah, I just did. Thank you. Um, yeah, I just put it in the chat as well. Any light you can share on the uh, UN uh, UNRWA debacle um, and uh, the not so new idea to shutter it and add responsibility to, to uh, the other refugee agency, the UNHCR? Okay, so the answer is first of all, um, you know, UNRWA was born in sin. UNRWA should never have existed. UNRWA perpetuates the idea of Palestinian refugee status through 55 generations. No other UN agency that deals with refugees does that. That said, we shouldn't be surprised. UNRWA is staffed 95% or 98% by Palestinians and who have an interest in maintaining their refugee status. So I'm not surprised. I'm. Um, it is what it is. Now, the problem is you need to replace it. and you need to replace it with something else because something has to take over what UNRWA is doing. So if you don't even have a plan for how who's going to minister Gaza, how can you replace UNRWA with the something else? Now, if you want to turn it over to the other UN agency, in theory, that's fine. Uh, my fear is twofold. First of all, I'm not sure how you do that from a legal standpoint in the United Nations. It probably requires a decision of the General Assembly. I'm not positive. I'm not the expert on the rules of the United Nations but it might be my guess that requires a General Assembly resolution. If the Palestinians oppose the plan, I don't see getting a resolution to the Gen General Assembly, uh, you know, taking closing UNRWA and putting it into the uh, High Commissioner of Refugees. Um, the High Commissioner of Refugees' job it is to resettle refugees. And the Palestinians don't want to be resettled. That's part of the problem here. Um, now, that doesn't say, I mean, can you... Reform UNRWA, you can, but again, you have to replace its employees, and its employees are all Palestinians and mostly Hamas members, or a large extent Hamas members. You know, we look at their look, we look at their school schooling, right? The schooling is very anti-Israel, anti-Jewish, anti-Israel more than anything else. Do we really expect the Palestinians with the history they have, in other words? I am a strong believer that from the historical weight of everything, that's the Palestinians' fault that they don't have any state. They could have gotten the state at least four or five times in history, and they don't. But let's put that aside for the moment, because that's the leadership, that's the Palestinians as a whole. If you're the average Palestinian who has no control of what your leadership did all these years, and you live the lives they have with the relationship they have with Israel, you're not going to be Israel lovers. And unless you can give them something else to educate towards, right? In other words, um, it's on okay. so, 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 so it, I, I see that as being a, a real challenge and I don't know how to get around it, to be honest with you. It takes a generation to do it, then you need a plan and long range planning is not one of our specialties. Let's put it that way. Okay, who else? Mark? Yes, Paul. Mark? Go ahead. Uh, yeah, so I have a question about the uh, US strike uh, in Iraq. And my question is this, uh, after the strike, the Iraqis were very angry, you violated our territory uh, and they want us out, okay? The US is in Iraq primarily to fight ISIS, if I'm not mistaken, okay? If we pull out, let Iraq fight ISIS, let Iran fight ISIS. Uh, our ISIS killed what, 100 Iranians at that, at that funeral a few weeks ago? The resources that Iran and Iraq have to use to fight ISIS are resources that can't be used against the U.S. and Israel. So why doesn't the U.S. just get out of there and say to Iran and Iraq, you want to fight ISIS? It's your job. Okay, let's start with the fact that the Iraq wants us to remain. They're just saying, they just, it's, it's, it's performative okay. to tell them we, we don't want them there. Uh, they want us there, number one. Um, I believe the bases there provide a... Uh, they're not fighting so much as they're in intelligent bases and they're a place for special forces to take action against potential terrorists. It's like a forward base that allows uh, special forces and others to operate. So I think it's still in America's interest to stay there. Um, ISIS obviously doesn't limit itself to attacking Iraq and Iran. ISIS has tried to attack worldwide. And as we learned on, you know, uh, in 2001, uh, 2011, excuse me, the, 2001, excuse me, um, when uh, you let terrorists uh, build up their base somewhere, they can attack anywhere in the world. So that's why the United States wants to remain there. It's an American's interest. 
we don't have a lot of troops there. Um, but, you know, Iran wants us out because it's a, an intelligence base more than anything else. So I don't think, and I certainly don't think the United States should pull out because, um, because the, you know, because of these attacks, that would be giving Iran a, a victory. And so at the moment, if we want to decide six So months, you think Iran would be, if the U.S. If the U.S. US pulled out, out now, it would be Iraq, a victory for Iran. Iran but, would be better off, you think? What? If the U.S. Okay. pulled out right now. Oh, that's a good answer. Thank you. Okay. Next. Okay, Tamar. Why do I not see people's hands up? I don't understand, but okay, go ahead. Tamar. Tamara, excuse me. Okay, Michael. Okay, I'm not sure which mm -hmm. Michael, but unmute mute yourself. Okay. It's Michael later, just to break the silence, but I have a question too. I think it, it it's a, your answer, if you choose to give one, is speculative, and it, you, you could talk about this for an hour. But mostly when Pakistan went nuclear, and at least at the moment, uh, hopefully Iran isn't nuclear, but God knows how long that will last, the feeling was that unlike Russia, China, and other places that respect mutually assured destruction, that there are enough religious zealots in Pakistan and possibly in Iran that they would welcome destruction of the world because they think that's going to bring uh, their version of the Messiah or something. You you think Iran would have any reluctance to uh, to go nuclear if they had the weapons? Okay. The question is, would they use the weapons? Let's put it that way. That's that's more than anything else. The question. My view is they they have their religious fanatics on one hand um but on the other hand they would um they would um use them if they thought it would could destroy israel now if they could accomplish the task of destroying israel i think they might actually use them my view of our de missile defense system is that while it's not a hundred percent it looks right now it's been a hundred percent but you know you fire a hundred missiles you may get one of them might get through or two of them might get through but because it's a high percentage of not getting through the worst outcome from iran is to fire a nuclear missile at us and for it to blow up over the Jordanian desert somewhere else. that is an outcome which would be very problematic for them and more than problematic and that's an outcome they wouldn't want to take a risk of because then they were taking a risk of getting some part of that country destroyed without destroying israel um they could never you know destroy all of Israel and um, not have that country destroyed. Also, uh, nuclear weapons aren't as, you know, atomic bombs are not as powerful as one thinks. It may be terrible if one hit Tel Aviv, I wouldn't be here, but people in Cholon and in Bat Yam and all the places around would be, even in North Tel Aviv. Um, you know, Hiroshima-sized bombs in a situation with modern buildings and everything else don't have quite the, we're not talking about H-bombs, let's put it that way. Um, but again, it'll be terrible, and I don't know what what it, what is it will be like afterwards. God forbid. But I don't think they're willing to take a risk of firing a bomb at us, and it not getting through. That's always been the reason I supported strongly a missile defense system, not because it was hermetic, but because it created a um, an if question for any of them, and the risk that any sane people, even if they hate us and want us destroyed, would uh, not want to take. Gary. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, what's your take on Biden's uh, sanctions of uh, two uh, radical West Bank settlers? Um, okay, so, so Biden sanctioned these particular settlers basically because the Israeli government won't take any action. That's the reality. Um, we do not take any action against these people, except in the most extreme cases. Certainly now with the current police commissioner and everything involved in that, we don't take action against them at all. Uh, they just cause problems. Now, I'm not talking about the, all the settlers. 
but the settlers that go and and you know burn Arab buildings and all those type of things, they are terrorists in their own route, and we're not um, we're not doing anything to stop them. So I think it's a statement. Um, I have no problem with it. Um, these people should have consequences for what they do. Um, so I'm I have no problem with it. Um, could say it's an interference in American Israeli domestic affairs. I guess so, but um, I like I said, I have no problem with it. All right, I'm ready now. Um, actually, okay. Tamara sent me her question, and it is the absence of civilian pressure on Arab Muslim world to pressure Hamas the same way Jews are being pressured. Um, the regard to strike me as an overemphasis on Gaza, as though she the war is really exclusively in Syria. Okay. Okay, um, look, there is an imbalance to begin with, right? Uh, the question that she's basically asking is, why all the pressure on Jews as opposed to pressures on Muslims to pressure Hamas um, to release the hostages? Well, you know, one of the strange things about all, everything that took place um, in terms of all the anti-Israel protests that have taken place, if they would have started uh, two weeks into the war, three weeks into the war, as we started destroying parts of Gaza, as the civilian toll in Gaza began to mount, you could argue that this was about, you know, that people don't want to see civilians being hurt, etc., and the images were bad that were coming out. Um, some of them were not real, but okay. And the death tolls are clearly not accurate, but okay. You could understand why people would be upset by those sort of things. However, the demonstrations began the day after their attack. The day that we had been attacked, that our people had been murdered, raped, beheaded, and all the other terrible things that took place on October 7th, that's when pro-Hamas demonstrations broke out in various parts of the United States and various college campuses. So why would they pro why would they pressure them to release the hostages? People seem to think it's a great thing that they have hostages. You know, the 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 um, slogan yesterday, yesterday, Friday, Friday at Columbia University was by all means, you know, end, end the colonial occupation of Palestine by all means. All means means taking hostages, killing people, ch children and everything else. All means are okay because you're fighting colonialism. So we have this terrible imbalance. I don't even know what to describe it. Um, we've moved from a fight over 67 to a fight over 48. And the very legitimacy of our existence by these demonstrators is being more than questioned. It's a result of years and years of propaganda. We sort of left the, the college campuses to a very large degree to Qatar and uh, all of the, uh, the Saudis and all the other people who funded all these Middle East institutes all over the United States, uh, who, who funded fellowships and postdocs and you name it. And we end up with a generation of professors who are very anti-Israel, we're very pro-Palestinian. We have a lot of Palestinian professors in American universities as well. Again, I don't want to, I have nothing against Palestinians individually, but they're not going to be pro-Israel, let's put it that way. And there was no counterattempt on the other way. You know, it's very nice that the Jewish billionaires are giving money to build hospitals in Israel and who knows what. All the money that's going from the United States into Israel should be going, American Jewish money I'm talking about right now, should be going to a long-term plan not just propaganda, but education and, and you know, not, you know, how, stop with the Holocaust education. Teaching me about the Holocaust does not stop anti-Semitism. I'm not saying don't teach it for the Holocaust at all, but that is not the magic bullet. And you need a long-term educational policy. I don't, you know, I couldn't develop it on one foot, but it requires a lot of bright people to sit down and think about it, think about a plan, find a billion dollars, find $2 billion, find really large sums of money, to implement it over a 10-year period, a five-year period, a long-term plan so that you can you can fight it. You know, I remember a couple of weeks ago I was on a on a show on, on I-24, and the host um of the of the show was um Owen Alterman, um, who's their foreign affairs correspondent, I believe. I've known him for many years at this point. And I made that argument, and he first said, Well, we've lost America already. And I said, No. All we need to do is turn 10% that we're going to lose um, in a different direction. 
uh, but it requires effort. And just having Hillel's and Chabad's on campuses is not the effort that's required. Um, and having Apex is also, you know, the Apex is very nice, raise money for Israel. That's not what we need to do on college campus. Most insane thing. I, for, I used to fight years ago, UJ on campus and APAC on campus. I used to say, you know, we, this is what you're doing. You want, you, your whole point is to bring up a generation of Jews so they know how to give money. No, you need to be spending you spending the money, not to get money, but to worry about the long-term impact of what's going on and what's being educated on college campuses, maybe even high schools too, but on college campuses. You need to look at social media in a deep, deep way. So people need to sit down with Mark Zuckerberg, who seems to have redeveloped his Jewishness, and try to figure use his brain to figure out what we can do in terms of social media. Uh, we need a, a long-term serious project, not fighting anti-Semitism per se on the, you know, this guy said this and that guy said that, etc. There's plenty of that. But a long-term educational policy that both explains Israel and Jews and everything that relates to it. And again, it's not going to convince everybody. But all we need to do is make sure that some 10% or so that might be going the other way get pushed in our direction. But that's that alone is going to take billions of dollars in many years. Anyway, uh, Michael. Uh, which yeah, Michael? can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Right. The very first paragraph of the genocide ruling, which incidentally I thought was rather well balanced, said that the hostages should be released unconditionally and immediately. And I don't understand why everybody totally ignores that. Um, and presumably um, Hamas aren't going to and haven't released the hostages immediately and unconditionally, in which case they have breached um, their part of what they're supposed to do. So there must be some consequences to that, don't you think? That, well, uh, and, if, and, if it, Go ahead. and if Israel's making a bit of an attempt, which they are, and they and Hamas has made no attempt, then what? Remember, there's a problem, though. Once again, why this thing is so uneven. The reality is that... Um, that I could find. Michael Ada, please mute yourself. Um, yeah, the, 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 the problem is um, that Hamas is not a signature. They're not a country. I mean, even though they claim to be sort of a country, they're not a country. They're not acting as a country. But then South Africa takes on responsibility because you're not supposed to give any assistance to any uh, organization that's committing um, genocide either. Yeah, well, absolutely. But South Africa is not coming with its clean hands. Let's understand that South Africa was doing. Well, this shouldn't against... we take action against South Africa? Who's going to take for that action? Hamas. Who's going to take action uh, against South Africa? In the international court. In the international court. Yeah, the international court's not going to take any action. You know, understand the fact that the actual action of the international court takes years and years. All they can do is interim emergency decisions, and emergency decisions wouldn't wouldn't be in existence in this place against South Africa because South Africa is not doing anything to have an immediate impact. Um, but yes, it should be. It's uneven. You know, it's not even. Nothing is even about any of this. Look, I understand the people in um, who are right now trying to block the humanitarian shipments. I understand them. I understand the logic initially of not letting in any humanitarian assistance to Gaza, right? I mean, it seems pretty clear cut. If you're not going to at least let the Red Cross visit our hostages, why should we give any humanitarian assistance to your people? You claim to be the government of Gaza. You know, excuse me, um, the idea of a siege goes back to ancient times, and a siege has not been outlawed in international, you know, in international law. You can have a siege and people can give in. And as soon as they give in, you end the siege and you, you know, send in food and everything else. But the world wouldn't go for that. You know, the starving children story. And we keep on hearing about these starving children in Gaza, the UN keeps on saying, even though there's enough food going in to feed all the children, but maybe Hamas isn't letting it go to the children. I don't really know. Um, so there's no part of this that's that, that's equal, that that's fair. You have UN, you have UN representatives in Gaza who are Palestinians and talking on behalf of the United Nations. Uh, so there is no part of this that is fair. There's no part that says they should be able to hold hostages. Um, but I guess fair is not where we are in this world, and then legally we're not even where we are in this world. So I don't really know. I don't have an answer. You know, like I said, I my heart is with the people stopping the shipments, but I understand we can't do that because the United States is insisting we do it, and the United States is insisting we do it 
for the reasons that in order to maintain political support for the rest of the world, the rest of the world seems to think we have to give humanitarian aid to the people. You know, there is a very big disconnect that, you know, Hamas is this organization that represents, you know, maybe a small percentage of the Gazans and therefore, you know, we, it's not fair to the rest of the Gazans because Hamas did what it did. Well, Hamas number one was elected to office. I don't know whether they'd be elected right now, but at least, you know, in the West Bank, it has support of 80 something percent and Gaza less now because some people have understood the consequences. Israeli soldiers who go through the houses in Gaza basically say that every single house they go into shows supporters of Hamas everywhere. And I'm sure most people in Gaza supported them. Some didn't. Some of them wanted their freedom. Some of them were anti-religious and didn't want to have religious police telling them what to do and all those things. But the majority of people supported them. Um, so, again, there's nothing fair about this at all. There's nothing right about but, this. But going back to the review in a month, doesn't it count for anything that Hamas haven't done their side of it? So, the, uh, so they'll say they Hamas hasn't done their side. Look, the review is basically going to say, I think realistically, I mean, the amount of, um, there is not the high level of, of uh, warfare that was up until now. The warfare is more limited to one location. Uh, we do not hear about large numbers of Palestinians being killed on a regular basis at this point. Most of the activity is taking place from the ground and not from the air. Um, so I don't think, I think the review is not going to come back very problematic for us. If I was Israel, I would do a few more things. I would have set up a, a um, neonatal or a, a, a small field hospital for pregnant women. I mean, none of them have to come, but you set up in a protected area, a hospital just for, uh, just for pregnant women. And what's the UN going to say? One of the, one of the, one of the items where we were stopping Palestinians from giving birth. So Create a hospital for, for Palestinians to get a field hospital for Palestinians to give birth. But our government isn't creative enough to understand that even if not one Palestinian came to it, just the act of setting it up would eliminate one of the uh one of the CF and one of the one of the items in their agenda. So I bet they would come actually. I bet they, they would. Probably would come in the end, yes. But you know, again, uh, we have a very un you know, a, a government that's what can I say? Uncreative is the way I'll describe it for the moment. So people will scream, what are you helping those Palestinians? They're holding our hostages. Well, okay. They are holding our hostages. On the other hand, the UN is saying we're not helping, you know, we're, we're trying to stop them from giving birth, which was false to begin with. But okay, do something to prove them wrong and just eliminate that, that thing completely. But that's where we stand. Uh, Michael. I don't know which Michael. Howard, okay. I'm being told to say Howard. So Howard. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Mark. And thank you for doing what you're doing here every two weeks, even though I know you don't want to be doing it. Um, could you go back to uh, internal politics for a minute? I'm wondering whether at this stage, after this amount of time and everything that has happened, if the pressures on the current coalition are building to the point where something may break soon because it's pretty clear that their inaction and their failure to do any kind of strategic thinking and Bibi's insistence on clinging to power at any cost is is making things a lot worse than they need to be. Is anything moving in that direction? I fear not, and I fear not for counterintuitive reasons because. Yeah, everything you said is true, and the polls are reflecting it. Uh, the fact is that you know the co current coalition gets the lowest number of votes in any of the recent polls. Um, so clearly, the people don't want them. But the very fact that they're polling so poorly makes every member of the coalition to hold on for dear life. And none of them want to get out of power. They're all enjoying being in the Knesset, earning their salaries, earning the various perks that come with being a member of Knesset. A lot of them are ministers and all the perks that come from being a minister. And none of them want to lose their jobs, and their ability to appoint their friends and their relatives and God knows what to the positions. So all the reasons that they're so unpopular lends itself to them not voting them out. Now, you know, are there five people in Likud who are willing to cross over and so far through everything, none of them, not enough of them are willing to cross Netanyahu. 
maybe one day, maybe someday, maybe it's about to happen. I don't know. Uh, maybe when the war actually ends, whatever that is, there'll be enough to to blow it up. Or maybe Ben Gvir will will bolt because he doesn't like one of the agreements. That, of course, will end the government uh, pretty much. Um, there's also the option, the possibility. It's outside, but it's not totally outside. The members of the Shas party, they've been the tremendous surprise of this government. Um, they have ministers that have been incredibly competent, incredible, incredibly thoughtful. We've all been shocked by it. The minister <laughs> of interior, the minister of health, and the minister of social welfare are all from, from Shas. I think they have another, another minister or two that I don't remember. But those three people have been outspoken, have spoken up against some of the things, some of the government, and they've been working. I mean, actually doing things successfully in, in their spheres and doing a good job of it. And Shasp has always been, I mean, it's been aligned with Likud for a long time, and Ari Derry has been aligned with Netanyahu for a long time. But if Ari Derry and Shas comes to the conclusion that this is a sinking ship, and they're better to get off that ship now before it's too late, um, they could bring down the government without even bringing, you know, without, they could bring down the government without new elections. In other words, that, that is probably the outside chance that is the most likely, more likely than only could people breaking is the chance that Shas would would break and, and support the formation of an alternative government. There's a lot of talk that Shas is much more comfortable with Gantz and Gallant than they are with Smutridge and Ben Gvir, let's put it that way. So that's the hope, let's put it that way. So, you know, there aren't a lot of optimistic things these days. That's the optimistic thing that I'll hold on to that um, maybe it'll happen. I'm just checking. There have been, um, it's exactly seven o'clock and so far no notifications of, uh, that the, um, and no notifications yet from from Hamas that they've uh, accepted or not accepted the agreement. So, um, Claude has, Claude, go ahead. Why isn't it? Quick, just a quick question. What's the reaction been in Israel, if any, to the Republicans' unwillingness to uh, allocate funds to uh, Ukraine and to Israel, uh, and and holding it all up because of the uh, the border or for okay, any? So uh, there hasn't been a lot of a lot of um, reaction because the feeling has always been that eventually uh, the aid to Israel will come through. One way or the other, that was, but was, you know, even from the very beginning, people said that, you know, it could be problematic, it could take a while, but eventually that'll be passed. And I think uh, uh, the esteemed House Speaker, and I say that with uh, with quotation marks, just said he's putting putting forth a, a, a bill with just the Israel aid, without Ukraine and without the border. Um, Israelis do not understand Ukraine, do not understand the importance of Ukraine. I mean, they've been too busy dealing with their own issues. And unfortunately, our policy before the war relating to Ukraine, I think, has been atrocious. And, I, you know, those are the two, well, the, the, two, the two moments that I felt most embarrassed to be an Israeli was A, our attitude towards Ukraine, and B, our attitude during the civil war in Syria. In both cases, I thought we needed to take action and be clear on the, si on, on the right side of it, in both cases for quote unquote strategic decisions, but I think short term strategic decisions, we did not take the right side of those of those positions. I don't think we've quite paid the price, but we could have paid the price. I mean, people in the Sy Syrian people paid the price uh, without a doubt. And Ukraine to some extent certainly could have helped with some of our technology, although right now I'm glad we didn't sell them any weapons because we need all those weapons here for the moment. But uh, that's something else. So, no, I don't think Israelis are particularly even aware of the problem per se. Yeah, there's something going on in Congress. They'll eventually agree to it. And none of it's affected the day to day supply of arms. If Israel has to pay for the arms in the meantime, Israel can afford to. It just means going greater in depth, but Israel can, can afford to pay for the arms. So, it's not really an emergency problem. It's just out there. But, like I said, I believe that the. Um, election of Donald Trump will be an existential threat for Israel, not directly, but indirectly. Um, Michael. Yes, hello, and thank you. Um, two questions. 
Could you speak a little bit about what's going on on the West Bank and how explosive that situation might be? And number two, you know, you've talked a lot about the lack of a day after plan uh, from Israel's side. I'm curious if, if you could speculate about what you, how you think Hamas might, let's say Israel is successful in uh, knocking Hamas out of Gaza. How might Hamas reconstitute itself? I don't imagine they're just going away. I mean, it's one thing to, to um, defang them, if you will, uh, militarily, but the political organization of Hamas is still intact. How, what's their idea? What would their day after look like, in your opinion? Okay, so, um, okay, I'll do this back for a second question first, and then go to the West Bank. Um, look, in their opinion, they they're going to reconquer. They're going to come out of the. They're going to come out of the tunnels. They're going to wave a victory sign. See, we're still here. You didn't kill us, and they're going to take on governing Gaza as best as they can. Um, and certainly, if you know our plan isn't that any, you know. Any Hamas person who's clearly Hamas, a policeman or everything else, we're just going to kill them from the, from the air, uh, which we're not doing. I don't even understand why we're not doing it in other parts of Gaza, but leave that part aside. Um, they'll just take control again unless there's another someone else to take control. That's the reality. In other words, if, if Israel defangs them enough militarily that they cease being an effective military force and instead, uh, for the sake of argument, a reconstituted Palestinian authority takes over civil role with a multinational Arab force being the police force in Gaza, that might work. I don't know that it would work, but it might work. It might be an alternative. But unless you create someone else with boots on the ground, with guns in hand, to maintain order and um, control it, you might as well just retake control of it. There's no question in my mind. I don't see any other alternative unless you have an alternative in place. There is no such thing as a vacuum. And unless you have an alternative, they will take, they'll take, you know, political control directly. Once they have political control, they'll have uh, access to money and everything else, and they'll go about, you know, digging some new tunnels. Uh, well, let's assume for a minute, if I may, that um, Israel has no plan, and the Arab states are not involved, and now you have a protracted presence uh, of Israel in Gaza. Um, aren't we now just going to be looking at a guerrilla kind of war? Yeah, for every large extent. Uh, it's going to be a guerrilla war. It's going to be in and out. It's going to be going on. But Israel doesn't... No one wants that kind of war. Let's put it that way. Uh, yes, there'll always be a requirement to keep on maybe going in for select places. But look, unless Israel occupies all of it, which would require thousands of troops, uh, they're going to take over again civilly. And we might go after some military targets if we get the right intelligence that they're doing X, Y, and Z. But, you know, I wouldn't trust our intelligence at this point to know what they're doing. We've obviously not done very well until now. Um, so I don't see anything good coming out of this at this point unless we have a political plan. And we're late. We're very, very late. We should have had a political plan the moment we went in and start implementing it in the areas we take over. Uh, you know, you don't, you can't come up with a political plan, plan 100 days into your invasion, so to speak, and then, you know, expect it's going to work because it's going to take time to do it. And you, the max, the time to implement the political plan is when you have the maximum political military pressure in place. You know, the United States um, plan for Germany, which included a military administration initially and a transition to a political government over a period of time, that plan was in place before the first Americans reached the uh, town of Atchin on the, you know, on, on the Rhine River and crossed the Rhine. America had a plan for what was going to be in Germany day after. Uh, they had negotiated a plan with the Russians and, you know, the four powers had come to an agreement with how Germany was going to be occupied and the U.S. knew what it was going to try to do in its zone. Um, things changed. Didn't, you know, the exact plan didn't end up being what happened, but they had a plan. You can't do this without a plan. That's the reality. And that's the, the tragedy of this. No plan means no success. As to the West Bank, the West Bank has 
multiple complications. Complication number one is the fact that we're not letting in Palestinians from the West Bank to work inside of Israel now. This is before, since, since the war began, which means they're not getting the money uh, that they were bringing back. And there was a major source of income with Palestinians working in Israel, making Israeli sides or significantly more money than Palestinians did inside the West Bank. And so they're not bringing in the money. That's creating an economic hardship that is growing in the West Bank. I think, I'm not totally sure, but I think we solved the problem of the um, of the government in the West Bank getting money to pay its own salaries. And so that I think is taking place. That relieves a certain percentage of the of the of the problem there. Um, reality is we've been acting very actively in the West Bank. Let's put it this way: we've apprehended two thousand and more suspects. Some of them Hamas members, some of them other others. I'm sure some of them are probably not guilty, but that's a different story altogether. But we've apprehended and we've been in every city and every place, and um, so far we've managed to tap down. Uh, the violence to a pretty minimal degree. Can we keep on doing that? I don't know. But again, it comes down to, again, what's your plan? What's your long-term plan? We haven't had a long-term plan for the West Bank since 1967. And that's part of our problem. And I don't care which the plan is. I, again, I'm a strong believer. You may have a bad plan, but you got to have a plan. You got to know where you're trying to get to. If you don't know where you're trying to get to, you just you're you're stumbling in darkness and whoever has the political power at that particular moment gets his way and that's a terrible plan terrible terrible plan okay anybody else we're at the hour plus period and then let's check my notifications and there is no notifications of an answer so another story that came out of saudi arabia that we'd get an answer at seven o'clock um Maybe we'll have it. Maybe I'll have something before I release the update at about eleven o'clock our time. Maybe we'll have some news. Um, maybe not. I don't know. Anyway, I thank you all for participating. Um, the this will hopefully be, the video transcript will be up um, on the. We'll go out with the update um, this evening, um, and we'll see you all in two weeks. So, have a good one, everybody.